It's time to down your unders. Down your unders. Review and dissection of content from some of the sharpest minds in the game. Hosted by Adam Camilleri. Art of War. Down Under. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this episode one of episode 171 of the Art of War Down Under podcast. My name is always Adam Camilleri, and I am suffering with a bit of the, 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 the spicy cough at the moment. I'm on the back end of my fourth round battling the COVID. So please forgive me if this is a shorter episode and my voice is not as it's good as it usually is. To that end, though, I brought on two spectacular Australian 40K players to hopefully carry me through this one. Um, that being Mr. Chris Wright, CanCon winner, ITC winner, WTC winner, absolute freaking legend. Did I, I hope, I hope actually, have you won the ITC in Australia? Uh, yes, yes, I won it. I remember yes. um, the year before COVID started. Yeah, that CanCon win got me that ITC win. You beauty. My memory is uh, is correct. And Mr. Matt Morisoli. Pretty much all exactly the same accolades I just said for Chris, um, except for CanCon. You haven't won a CanCon, have you, brother? But you've won pretty yeah. much everything else uh, by a multitude. I got Uprising instead, but it's Uprising virtually CanCon. Can, can, CanCon is like the the classic, <laughs> the classic it is. hot summer shed event. Uprising, to be fair, was in a hot scout hall thing. Um, equally hot, but not quite as CanCon as CanCon. It's 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 young young younger, more attractive cousin or something. Um, but definitely incredible accolades nonetheless. And these two stellar gentlemen are going to help us talk about, not quite review, but talk about the current missions for 10th edition, that being mostly the Leviathan mission pack. Um, we're not going to be reviewing it as that nauseam reading out everything and then talking about it one at a time. I've done that for like probably the last 20 episodes straight. I'm ready to kick back with my little COVID bug and just have some talking eds, good times with some mates and talk about the state of the game, the state of competitive play via the lens of the missions. So that being, we're going to be talking about where missions have come from essentially from the modern era of the game in 8th edition all the way through ninth into 10th, what it look like now, um, what we like about them, not like about them, good things, bad things, terrain, we're going to talk about a little bit as well. But if you want to get the second part of this podcast, which will be over on Patreon at Art of War Down Under, you can jump over there and that'll be me and these two fine gentlemen discussing a bunch of Patreon questions, which of course you can be a part of if you would like. Solly, would you like to plug anything? Oh, look, I think... Um... I, I think I've been on this show enough times that people kind of know my spiel. But, look, I do coaching with The Art of War. If you're interested in learning a bit more about that, you can visit theartofwar40k.com. Um, you can pin me in The Art of War Discord there as well. Uh, in addition to that, um, I, as well as Chris, uh, are a part of the um, you know, Warhammer Australia, the 40K Australia team. I think Chris isn't playing next year, but still a part of the team. You can follow us uh, at you know um, Team Australia 40K on Facebook there and see some cool stuff that team does over there. Yeah, boy. So let me. So just to preface this, you boys have been to three WTCs now each. Is that correct? I oh, know Chris uh, two has been to two. two, two and yeah, two and um, yeah. the last DTC I've played. So just to put that in context, so Solly and Matt Marcelli in 2019 came fourth, and then Matt and Chris in 2022 came first, and then in 2023 came third. So you've been three times, Matt, and have never not top forward. That's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, we, we played for the win when we came forth we as did. well. We, we, we were equal second on round points, just not enough battle points because uh, it was very, very close at the top between, I think it was Russia and um, oh, I can't remember who else it was, but there were, there were three teams that were all sort of within yeah. 20 battle points was, or something of each other. Yeah, I can't remember who that was. Was it France? Might have, might have been France. France or Spain, France, yeah. I think. I don't know. It's yeah. it's not in 20 Keeper, so it's impossible to go back and find properly <laughs> now because that website is made of spaghetti. Um, yeah, I, I, apparently I couldn't get a win until uh, we took Chris with us as well. So that's right. That's yeah. of we, we, couldn't make the, we couldn't make the podium until Chris rocked up. And Chris only coming twice and the po hitting the podium both times. Absolutely stellar. But anyway, thank you very much for both of what you've done for Australian 40K, gents. Let's jump in and talk about these missions a little bit. So I'm going to describe what I remember. We've got some reverb. We're good. I'm going to describe what I remember, I guess, from 8th edition... 
um, missions, and then I'll hit it to Chris for ninth, and then Solo can tell us about the state of the tenth right now. Edition missions. So, eighth edition missions essentially was before we coalesced into a single mission structure. We very much still had the divide between, I suppose, the two biggest camps being the ITC missions and the WTC missions. That's pretty much correct, yeah. Uh, is that right? I'll, I'll be honest. I don't remember that edition. I think that's right. <laughs> the, the days it of yours, right seven, me, yeah. seven years ago. WTC missions were as an amalgam of everything that GW had in their in their packs. It had um, primary mission scoring, which was usually end of game. And then it had um, secondary missions, a la there were the Maelstrom mission cards, and they had tertiary missions, which is either a Bosun missions or it was first Blood Warlord, Line Breaker, that kind of stuff. And those were added together to create the WTC mission scoring format, which was, <clears throat> well, as it, sorry, that was ETC, apologies, which was a bit of an unwieldy beast, <laughs> to say the least. There was a lot going on in those missions, and it could get very overwhelming. The ITC has stand, had standardized things at that point to make missions very, um, I guess, it, it, different. You still had player placed, um, player placed uh, uh, objectives, objectives, but yeah. all the all the missions were based on kill, killing and killing more, holding and holding more objectives, and that gave you a bunch of points. And then you would pick secondary objectives, uh, game by game, like a, a lot that you did in in ninth edition, and that was a pretty that held us pretty good. And I did enjoy the variety at the time, also, but. Chris, tell us about the state of the missions in ninth edition. Um, yeah, so ninth edition, if I remember correctly, was a pretty similar format throughout the entire edition, um, though it, it varied a little bit. But the, the themes were the same. That was there was typically forty five points available for primaries, forty five points available for secondaries. Um, so the primaries were generally five points for holding one, another five for holding two, and uh, another five if you held more. Uh, some missions uh, move that to two slash three slash more. Um, and then the secondaries, there'd be a um, big set in the in the mission pack, um, which you could choose from. And then at various times, there were more faction secondaries you could um, throw in there. Uh, sometimes they're a bit less. Um, that was a bit of a, a variance throughout the edition. Uh, but yeah, on the whole, things were pretty similar. And uh, the biggest thing about that was for the first time, I think the whole world was playing the same mission structure now i think that was the very first time that it ever happened since maybe fifth but i, I wouldn't i'm not old enough to i wasn't playing enough in fifth to speak to it but solely what has 10th changed about the missions from ninth from eighth yeah so it's still pretty similar uh to that format i guess the really um the big difference is that some of the missions change up the hold one hold two hold more uh they're kind of like they're very varied now you know i think it used to be there were two out of um, two out of six or eight or whatever it was that were hold two, hold three. But now there are some that cap out at 10. There are some where, uh, you know, you've got the the added end of game, you know, the, the burn objectives, the hold objectives at the end of the game, that sort of thing. So on the, the primary front, it's kind of a similar format, but it's much more varied uh, by mission. Mm. And then on the secondary front, obviously, uh, instead of having just um, pick three like we did last edition, you've got the... Um, yeah, what most people do and play tactical and draw cards, uh, which is probably a, a very good flex between eighth and ninth. It's a little bit more of a balanced way to play uh, draw mission secondaries. Uh, or you can take your fixed secondaries, score slightly less points for each one, but sort of play the same objectives for the whole game. Um, so it's exactly right. you know, a good little blend of, um, of the Maelstrom cards and last edition secondaries without the uh, added imbalance of faction secondaries in there as well. I was about to say, that's the big loss, I guess, in the transition from ninth to 10th was the complete deletion of faction secondaries. How did you feel about that, Chris? I think that was a great choice. Uh, I think at no point were the faction secondaries anywhere near balanced. Um, I think there were some which were just like super easy to score. I remember at one point, sisters could just pick like three of their own faction secondaries and like guarantee score heaps of points. Mm. Um, some, some people would argue that that was like another way to balance factions. I never thought that was necessary. There are so many ways you can balance things in the game. Um, I think I saw it just as another way things could be imbalanced. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> and the fact that they never, they, like, they never made efforts to curtail them. Like, I thought the obvious thing to do was to just make it so you can take one per game. You can never take multiple faction secondaries. And the, the, like, there were so many levers they could have pulled, and then eventually they were just like, "Well, we're just going to delete these for tenth edition." Solly, what are your thoughts on that? Oh uh, yeah, I I think it created tremendous imbalance. I think it got to the point where 
um, you know, late in the edition, the first thing you were doing when a new codex came out was reading their secondaries, yeah. and then you were building armies to, you know, to, to maximize their efficiency at scoring secondaries. Um, I think that's one of the worst things they've ever done. In theory, it's a great idea, and thematically, it's a great idea, but in practice, like, they were just so dramatically imbalanced. There were so many armies that could just like pick really easy secondaries, and mm. then there was like you know. There was imbalance between armies that had very similar um, secondaries to one another. You know, there'd be uh, secondaries that functioned in a really similar way, but, you know, for one army it would just randomly be an extra point for doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I think going to universal secondaries has been oh, a, a very good change from that. Wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I remember reviewing <laughs> reviewing books in ninth edition that were fantastic books but had trash secondaries and therefore could not be as good as an equally good book that had one good secondary like one auto 15 and it was just so funny that by the end of like ninth we were rating things on how good their secondary packet was because necron still sucked on their, their codex still sucked but they had the best secondary suite for like almost 12 months and just absolutely dominated the game on multiple levels. I mean, the same could be said for Orcs. They had like, uh, cool, yeah, get the good bits, which was the most jacked OP secondary you could imagine, where a, gr a grot unit every turn just gets you five points. It was absolutely bonkers. But anyway, jumping to 10th edition, um, the, one of the things that really changed was GW was like, cards, cards for everything, cards for primary, cards for uh, cards for deployment zone card for everything um and a lot of people found that very overwhelming and scary at the start um but obviously i mean i i was always under the assumption that you know prior to the event heroes would flip some cards write some things down and we'd all start playing it that way right that was always the assumption yeah for for, for missions right it makes sense i think um like I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more shortly but i think there are some mission combinations that you can come up with that are just absolutely horrid to play and stupidly yeah. unbalanced and whatever um but there are also some that are great and there are some missions that are really really good so i don't know i, I don't think i've been to an event where anyone has randomed missions or they're all in event packs i don't know if you have chris but i don't think i've played a single event where the missions weren't either published in a player pack or like they're just told to you before the round i don't think i've seen anyone you know draw cards for the missions uh, at an event yep same here i think that is absolutely for the best but moving on like one of the things that i noticed about this was the deployment maps so we have five deployment maps but we have so i, I wish we had like more deployment maps if i don't know if that's so we've got our we've got our usual our dawn of war we've got our hammer and anvil we have our two versions of vanguard as our two versions of corners i don't really know what other variants we could have but the fact that we have like almost as standard now, the, the two-day events are six gamers. And plus we have eight games, we have nine gamers. Hell, we have 11 game events at times. I kind of wish we had more, but then I, I struggle to envision what those would be. Like what would they, what would they actually look like? Because we, we did have more, I think, in... I can't remember if it was eighth or ninth. Remember how we had, um, we had Small Dawn of War and Small Hammer and Anvil where they cut the edges off? Yeah, they were pointy hammer and anvil and pointy dawn of war. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. They sort were of cut deeper. Yeah, but sort of cut a bit back from the edges, but a bit went a bit further up in the middle. Um, mm. I, I, I'm totally fine with the amount they've got. I think it's totally fine replaying um, same deployments. Like, is when you mix in different missions and and all that. I think they feel very different. Yep. And um, I think even often dawn of wars, and if you wanted to play at tournaments. It can work if you've got the right terrain and the right missions, but um, I'm fine with running the other four multiple times um, per tournament. Well, that's what I was about to say. Because at times Dawn of War is just a bit of a nothing burger, as in like it's going to really favor dis or disfavor going first or one army over another, um, you're almost playing with four rather than five. Um, and then on top of that, I, always, I, I do think five objectives is the right number. But I would have loved to have one with six or one with four, just to mess with it a little bit. But then we do have we do have primary missions that remove them and, and mix that up. But Solly, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't think you need any more. I, I think the um, the deployment, like the deployments in this edition, are, are fine. I think that the um, you know the, the the thing that I don't like obviously is that the objective placement is set to the deployment map here, but admittedly the, um, the mission special, I can't remember what it's called, the one where you remove the one in the center and then set up an extra two um, kind of helps balance that out because it means you're not playing the exact same game every single time you play mm. um, the same deployment type. 
Uh, but I don't think you need any more. Like, sure, like uh, in, in theory, it sounds great. But you just got to remember, there's always that one deployment type that everyone rocks up to a table and says, oh, shit, I really, I hate this one. I hate setting this one up, whatever. It's, yeah. it's nice to help play relatively simple deployments, especially when, you know, preset terrain maps are a thing now in a lot of places. You spend so much time setting up terrain. You don't want to have to think any more than you actually already have to, uh, I, I think. I, I kind of like what we've got at the moment. Yeah, I think that's fair. The, so the other one, like you said, yeah, the um, the objective placement is fixed to the terrain map, which I think is a stroke of genius because it could have been just so much more complicated to have random. Like, there's another card set in here that is you roll for that is ter- that is um, <laughs> objective placement, which can just be a whole so hard to to get right. So I think they did do it the most elegant way that they could. Um, jumping over to the mission rules, uh, what's your hot take here? Um, Chris, uh, there are a lot of these, arguably, and possibly there are too many, some would say, because there's a couple in here that are just like servo skulls and, just, you know, it, it's such a such a hilarious state of things to be playing in an ultra-competitive event and uh, you rock up on servo skulls. Sorry, just to confirm, we're looking at the actual missions rather than the extra rules on them? Uh, um, the, are we looking apologies. at taking and hold Scorched Earth? Or yeah, 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 sorry. At- yeah, yeah. I jumped ahead okay. of myself. You go for it, mate. Um, all good there. So, yeah, I, I love that there's some variety in there because I did get a bit bored in ninth edition where all the missions were roughly the same and that was the whole edition. So I love that they've tried variety. I think some of them they got it bang on and I think some of it they got it wrong. So, yeah, um, some some plus, some minus. Mm-hmm. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I I agree. I think the variety is good. Look, it, it, it's a bit of a um, with great power comes great responsibility kind of thing here because you can make some very, uh, I'll say interesting for lack of a better word, um, missions with these rules. There are some that don't really play nicely together when you combine the mission and deployment and um, and mission special mm. rules. However, most of most of the actual missions themselves are fine. Now, there's a couple that aren't great. There's a couple that are overly complicated and sort of don't really ever get played. I think... The ritual is about as spicy as anything should ever be. Um, yep. that's probably right on the limits of what um you know of what's okay in a competitive setting. And then obviously there are like like you know, we mentioned servo skulls before, a few of those that are just a little bit a, a, a little bit silly. Um, but on the whole, I think they're pretty good. On the whole, I think the actual mission rules are pretty good. I think the variation on how you score points is good. I think that they are all just different enough from each other to keep you interested. Um, especially yep. when you consider that most really competitive players are playing, you know, what, 10, 15 GTs a year or you know, at least events a year. Yeah, that's, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 tournament games. It gets pretty dry playing the same five things 20 times. Mm. Um, but there's enough variation in here to keep it interesting. Beautiful. Um, transitioning to talking a little bit about, um, I guess, the other the third player when we talk, have to talk about missions, which is terrain. Like, there's no point really talking about mission structure if we're not talking about the the format upon which we play it. Of course, we had a tournament, the Leviathan Tournament Companion came out, um, essentially giving us the three standardized um, terrain layouts that would be, we would, or sorry, the four standardized terrain layouts that we would be seeing on any Games Workshop terrain um, table at any of their events, and therefore that trickled down to a lot of ad- adoption throughout the world. And then, you know, we have... Funnily enough, talking about eighth edition where we had um, different mission structures, ITC, WTC, it feels like tenth edition is the is the terrain the terrain philosophy uh, one where we still have our WTC um, format terrains and we still have our um, you know uh, now games workshop format terrains and we have ITC player place terrains as well. Uh, do these things dramatically change our opinions of? these leviathan missions or which terrain set out they are played upon because it's obvious that they were designed to be on the their ter- gw terrain layouts but what are your thoughts when they become adapted to other things does that change how you feel about it especially with the fact that you guys have played a phenomenal amount of wtc format yeah um it's it's definitely a different game on different terrain sets um i admittedly have not played much on the gw ones i i don't think they are uh as good for competitive games as the wtc ones are admittedly the new ones, the most recent ones they've put out, are a lot closer to, um, you know, to a really competitive uh, and interactive terrain set. Um, I think the WTC ones are just a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit more refined. I think they'll probably play tested a little bit more by, um, by better players as well, um, which you'd kind of expect given 
you know, what the event is and, you know, sort of uh, the the level of player involved, um, you know, in WTC and from the WTC organisational crew. Mm. Um, now, I think that um, player play strain on these is going to get a bit wacky. I am playing LVO this year, so it'll be interesting to see if they stick with the player play strain that they normally have. I assume they will. Um, it'll be interesting, yeah, to, to see how that goes, playing these missions on that. But in general, like, I, I, I do think that, you know, the most important thing about terrain now is the bases that the pieces are on. And GW and WTC have both got very similar, you know, base sizes on all their ruins. And, you know, it kind of sucks because we're reduced to, like, you know, using an acrylic base as your piece of terrain. Um, but for gameplay, that's all that really matters. Uh, and, you know, in, in general, it's okay. I think terrain rules are a bit wonky, but uh, in terms of how they affect the mission, uh, I think WTC and GW kind of affect the missions in a very similar way just because they're both, you know, based on having those, um, mm. you know, acrylic footprints as your terrain yeah. feature, essentially. I always think about it like they they want a certain percentage of the table to be covered by the terrain special rules or to be line of sight blocking. And so the way that they decided to do that was like, well, let's just make stuff that covers X amount of the table at all times. And um, I suppose that was the most elegant way. And you're absolutely right. Like we had, I mean, the WTC had hundreds of the best players in the world testing their terrain format for the year before we played the thing. So not surprising at all that theirs is uh, absolutely a little bit better because it is, I think it's the best terrain in the world. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I absolutely agree with the significance of the the bases, and I think it's um, I think it's fantastic. I, I think the biggest positive impact from that is that tournaments are just used to putting bases on their terrain now, which means even the the TOs that don't have that fantastic supply of terrain can still make a great event. Right? You can just put bases, and that kind of fixes any amount of sins with all the windows and all the wonky looking piece of the terrain. You have, um, so I'm a huge fan of that. I actually haven't played a single game on player place terrain in tenth, um, so I don't know how it interacts with the missions. Um, but I'm sure all those those people in the US have had heaps of opportunities to do that. So um, I'd love to hear what they think of it. Um, but yeah, I love WTC as well. Just to echo that mm. that sentiment. Fantastic. All right. Um, good things about these current missions, Solly. What are your favourite things? Um, so yeah, I think like we mentioned earlier, I think the variety is pretty good. I think that you get, um, you know, a very similar experience with, you know, a little bit of variety every time you play an event. Um, I don't think it's also fun for TOs to like put one, not necessarily completely wacky, but just slightly different spin on certain missions. You know, it's, it's good from a, a an event organizational perspective as well. Um, I, I'm pretty balanced. I, I, I do think, again, when you play this this uh, edition of 40K on good terrain, um, you know, you don't feel like you lose because your opponent has, you know, stupid faction secondaries. You don't really feel like you lose because the missions are wildly um, imbalanced and wildly favour a certain, you know, certain archetype of army. Um, but I also think that there are certain missions that some armies are better on, right? You can... You know, play a five-round event, you go there and you know there's two or three other really good players and you might say to yourself, well, shit, I really hope I don't get this guy on this mission because this mission is really good for this army. But it's also not, you know, so drastic that it's, um, you know, going to be the sole reason that you win or lose a game. So I I, I think the balance is pretty good, again, with the caveat that there are some, you know, some wildly uh, unbalanced missions uh, included uh, in um, in the pack if you so choose to play uh, you know, one of the weird missions with the weird mission special rules. It's just a bit wacky. Mm. Chris, what are your good things about these missions? Um, absolutely love the variety as well. Um, there is one caveat, which I'm sure we'll talk about the bad things. There's one mission that gets commonly played and I actually hate. Mm. Um, I, yeah, love, I, I really, really like that the um, uh, objective markers are different for the different deployments. I think that was a great idea to, um, put sort of include variety in where they are but like also balance it mm-hmm. and i think it's phenomenal that they've managed to include cards and have them feel good because i hated it in eight playing cards mm-hmm. um because they always used to have the objectives numbered and the cards to be like mm-hmm. hold objective one or whatever and it was yeah. so unbelievably bad <laughs> you would never play a game where it was like balance you would draw a card yep. and it would say hold objective one 
and that would be in your opponent's corner, and they would draw a card. It would also say, hold objective one. And, you know, um, so that was terrible. They've managed to make cards actually good. I wholeheartedly agree with that point. Since, what, 6th edition was the first time we had Maelstrom cards? It's been so obvious that Games Workshop is in love with selling us cards, and they want to sell (laughs) us cards. So they have done, for the first time, they have done a really good job of making us want to buy and play with the cards. I did enjoy enjoy Maelstrom for what it was, but I, like you, I got burnt by it so many times. Like, um, hell, there's an Australian Masters that I played at where my opponent drawed the six-point card top of turn one with his warlord standing on the objective. Incredible. Like, and I'm just like, well, shit, I just lose, right? <laughs> Top of turn one. Game of games, I'm already down by six points, which is atrocious. Um, so, yeah, but I, on the whole, I do think these are very good missions um, by the current modern state of the game. And they're, they're flexible and they've got a lot of variety and a lot of interesting things to happen there. In saying that, we, there are some bad things too. Chris, you want to kick off with a couple of things you dislike? Yeah, so... Just with the variety of the missions, I think it's it's important to have variety, but it's important to have some consistent themes in the variety. So, for instance, there are a few missions where you get points for holding your own objectives and a few missions where you don't, right? Your, your home objective does not score you points. Because there are multiple missions like that, you know you have to build around it when you're making a list. So, like, one of the reasons we haven't seen guard artillery, even when the points were were kind of broken for it, really kick off is because in most tournaments you're going to play multiple missions where you have to take the middle. Correct. There's one style of mission which is completely different to all the others, and that's Purge the Foe. And I think it's just a really bad design choice to have one mission where holding the objectives is pretty irrelevant. Like, it's almost always going to be mostly you hold your one objective, but no one holds more, right? All you need Mm. to do is to move any one of your units onto one mid-board objective, shoot them off the middle, they're never going to get hold more. So that mission almost always comes down to the kill, kill more. Um, And it's the only mission where that's relevant. So it's really hard to include that in your list building. Um, And so I find it really skews heavily in favor of some armies and against other armies. So like the guard gun line I mentioned before is amazing on that mission, whereas it is really bad on some others. And really fun interactive armies like, I don't know, you think of traditional Harlequins where um, their, their main game plan is to be sneaky, steal objectives, yes. but they're going to give away a lot of kill points. That army just sucks on that mission. Um, and I, I really, really hate that. Yeah, heavy MSUs would be, you know, significantly disincentivized for sure, dude. Uh, whereas, you know, players like Custodes would just have a laugh. <laughs> well, maybe in the past when they had the 10 bricks. Um, Solly, what are your bad things or dislikes? Well, firstly, I hard disagree with Chris's point there. I, I actually really like that mission. I think it's good because it's so different. And again, you're only ever, like, you're never going to play it more than once, right? No, No one's putting it in an event pack more than once. But I actually think that it's a good thing that it's, so different to the rest of them because it's already a familiar concept. Now, look, if you're a fresh player to 10th edition, it's probably less of a good experience for you. But if you've played competitive 40K for, you know, the last five years or so, and obviously COVID kind of skews that as well, but whatever. Um, If you've played from the ITC mission days, I actually really like the throwback. I think that it's, again, it's so different that it forces you to play in such a different way. And you're already sort of, incentivized to play armies that can play flexibly because, you know, generally playing tactical uh, is better, you know, for, for most armies. You know, there are certain builds that obviously play fixed really well, but having the ability to ditch cards for CP and having the ability to score more points for the, um, you know, the things that you achieve, you know, generally most armies want um, want to be able to play tactical. And I, I just like that it incentivizes you to play, um, you know, to, to, to be able to play flexibly and play a mission differently. But, uh, that could just be a personal taste thing. Maybe it's because I really like the ITC missions. Um, but anyway, I, I, look, I, my, my biggest gripe with this is that there are so many of these, like, mission special rules you just never see get played. I really hate mm. I've, I've spoken about this, I think, on your podcast a few times, Adam, where I've just spoken about how I hate that books come out and, like, 60% of a book, you know, the book might be fine, but 60% of the book's just never going to get played because the units are garbage or yep. the rules are bad yep. or whatever. It feels the same here. I'm like... I was flipping through these missions before and I'm like, you know, 
you know, like delayed reserves. Have you ever played a game with delayed reserves as your mission special <laughs> rule? I haven't. Yeah. Like, uh, like this card exists and someone or well, lots of people have gone and paid money for this you know, card in their set of cards. I've never played a game of this. And I've played, you know, a fair amount of 40K in the lead up to WTC. Now, sure, a lot of that was practicing the missions we were going to play, but like I've never played that mission special rule. You know, I've played yeah. Chosen Battlefield five times, six times. You know, I've played Secret Intel, I think, once. Like there's so many of these things that just don't get played and they could have been... Uh, a little bit less wonky and they'd actually get played. And that would have, again, really brought the addition uh, to life. I think I, I, if these had been a little bit less wonky and a little bit more, you know, competitively friendly, and it wouldn't have been too hard to do, I don't think, um, we'd have a really good mission set. Um, I have a, I whole, wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I think that's what I was getting. I was jumping the gun before when I mentioned deploy servo skulls and things of that ilk. That the, um, the mission special rules the the mission rules the mission cards they vary so wildly between things you can take seriously and things you can't you just can't take seriously um servo skulls of course uh, is a primary mission but entirely warps the way the mission is played the fact that chilling rain is a card is hilarious here is the card that is not a card congratulations um i would love it i love i'd love for them to have designed it in a way that there, there was no need for a chilling rain everything had a almost a tiered effect of severity of mission rules. Here's ones that matter a little bit, and here's ones that matter a lot. But they're all relevant, and all of them can be taken seriously. Because <laughs> that's a, you're exactly right, Sully. There are, there are some in here you just look at and you're like, do I have to? Or do, like Chosen Battlefield, I just don't read it. I just don't. There's so many words on that, on that card. It's hilarious. Chris, is this something that resonates with you as well? Yeah, look, I think it's... I think it's sort of there's some good things, but they did it wrong, right? I think they they probably should have found a better way to separate the competitive with the casual. Um, so maybe they bring out like a free PDF with probably the competitive one would be the one with just like, you know, the actual good missions. Maybe the cards are the ones for the, the casual players. Because like it is fun to play um, deploy servo skulls or it is fun to play delayed reserves or whatever. Um, so it is good that they exist, but it's probably not great that they exist in the same thing as the tournament mission pack. Yeah, I agree with that, that, that they're all in the same mix. But then again, that TOs have the, especially tournament organizers, have the option to drop off the ones they don't think they're going to be enjoyed by their their player base, their customer base. So I guess there is a bit of power in their hands. Um, but moving on, what would we like to see in the future? I know you just mentioned one of those, Chris, as in like you would like to see a, a, a strictly competitive, here is the competitive stack of cards. Nothing you can draw out of this deck will not will be irrelevant to you and how you like to play the game. I think that is a great product, and I think people would buy that. Yeah, I think that's the one you probably don't do as a deck, right? It doesn't really need to be cards if it's the competitive one. Um, I don't know. Um, anyway. G-Dub loves the cards, baby. They're always going to get the back of cards if they can make a back of cards. <laughs> they do uh, love you're absolutely to right. do that, yeah. Uh, they could just be like, okay, the competitive stack of cards is the regular stack, and just take these ones out. Um, Solly, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I just think like, how easy would it be for there to be a card that's like at the start of the game, pick one of the no man's land objectives. It's worth one extra VP every time you score yeah. it, right? So Stuff yeah. like that, you know, again, is not game breaking, but it but adds flavor. Um, you know, it prioritize it gives you a reason to prioritize playing for a certain objective, whatever. And again, that's just an example. But cards like that would get play, whereas cards like Vox Static, where it's like cool, two CP, two CP for a CP reroll. It's like, yeah, great. Yeah. Like that, 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 that's actually you know a, a bit of a a bit of a way to skew the game. It's it's, it's just a, a bit weird and it doesn't get played. But those other ones, I actually think would. I think if you made some cards with just again small effects that you know affect both players equally, but also kind of like come into play every turn of the game is what you, you sort of, you know, you need to do. Like the one, the one where you roll a six for an advance, you take a mortal wound. It's, it's just dumb. Like it affects, you know, some players, you know, more than others, but it doesn't really affect anyone at all. Like how often, how often is your one wound character rolling an advance, rolling a six and dying and actually having it affect the game? It, it just doesn't really happen. I don't think. Um, I wholeheartedly agree. And that, that that is an example of something that should be in this pack over Chilling Rain, you know? Yeah, well, there's, there's exactly. a problem when Chilling Rain's the default, right? Yeah. Like, there's yeah. a problem when most games are played on Chilling Rain. It means the rest of the 
the options aren't very good. Well, they needed exactly right. They needed to be more fundamental mission play things rather than trying to be because what they tried to do is to make them flavorful, make them interacting, inter- interacting, and make them um, add the thematic elements that they don't have when they standardize everything else. They're trying to make these be the spice when the spice should be something that 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 adds to the fundamental way the game's already being played. It should be something that adds on, not something from left of field, which is where they've kind of gone with these. Um, but I think we can all agree, apart from the mission rules, that most of it's a banger. Um, we, not, not the, the secondary is notwithstanding. We'll, we'll talk about those another time because they, they can be reviewed very systematically and weighed up very systematically where the fact that there, there's a kind of a random element to what missions you're going to be playing at, at XYZ event seem to be something more to be unpacked. Um, Overall, Chris, how happy are you with these these missions and this mission pack? Yeah, pretty pretty happy. Um, yeah, definitely uh, love love that we get to do some different things, and um, pretty happy on the whole. Fantastic, Solly. What about yourself? Uh, Eight point four Sugmas out of ten. I think it's uh, it's it's. <laughs> Got I, I, I think it's pretty good. I, I, I quite like it. I, I, the mission pack's pretty good. I think that it could have been better, but the 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 reason I rate it so highly is that all of the things that aren't good about it, you don't have to use. Um, I think you can kind of yes. like dodge out and all the stuff that's not actually, you know, fun or not actually competitive, and you can still make a mission pack that's you know that's pretty great. I always think there's missed opportunities there for it to be even better. Is kind of like the reason I'm taking yeah. Sugmas off out of ten. <laughs> I I actually entirely agree. I think this is. Uh, a great step forward in bringing together what the competitive community wants and what GW wants us to play. And I think they've done the best meld of the two that I've seen so far. Um, but yeah, like you, like you said, there's still room to grow and I think there's still places to go with it. Um, we're going to transition and talk about the actual overall state of the game for a little bit before we check out here today. But um, starting with you, Chris, coming back from WTC, of course, the balanced data slate dropped shortly after the, the, the entire complexity of the game has fundamentally changed. Um, is the is 10th edition in a really good place at the moment or is everyone just uh, everyone just drinking the Kool-Aid together because things look pretty rosy? Yeah, things things seem to be pretty good. Um, I've sort of not been viewing it through a competitive lens since I got back from WTC, but um, things, you know, the, the factions seem to be reasonably well balanced and the builds people are, are winning with just seem to be actually interesting lists to play. Like obviously not all of them, but um, there's not that much just like horrible skew that I've seen. Mm. Well, I suppose that's exactly right. Yeah. So the index index hammer when we just had indexes in the environment, everybody was just incentivized to just pack as much firepower as they could. There was almost no reason to do anything else. And now, I mean, it's uh, it's arguable which is the better army at the moment, Eldari or Chaos Space Marines. But Chaos Space Marines list is what I want armies to look like it's like a one yeah. third two third milli milli to shooting and it looks it's a it's a, a beautifully put together list can't say the same for the eldari but they, they do have a nice little balance of their own is that what you mean yeah um yeah that, that, on the whole it's interesting I, I do think on the whole melee needs a buff there are some things that work with melee um but there's not enough um but nonetheless they are yeah as you say the one third two third, that sort of thing that's that's what you want to see mm. Solly, what are your thoughts uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I totally agree. I think it's in the best place it has been this edition. Um, I, I, I I kind of agree. A, a lot of armies are starting to look more like actual armies now and not just, you know, as many guns I can possibly pack into here. It's taken a lot of nerfs to get here, um, which is a bit disappointing that it's, you know, it's sort of like taken us this long to get, um, you know, to a point where the game is fun and playable. But, like, I, I think the game's in a good state. I'm. Um, you know, I was definitely a bit pessimistic uh, coming back from WTC. I was pretty disincentivized to play because the meta was still wild and boring and, you know, Wraith Knights were still, you know, clapping everybody's cheeks and it wasn't a whole lot of fun. Um, but I, I think we're much better now than, you know, than it was earlier on. And I feel like the um, the balancing team is doing a pretty good job at the moment. I feel like the changes that are getting made are all... Uh, are all mostly you know, mostly spot on. So mm. feeling pretty good about it. Fair enough. Um, so just talking about 10th edition's goods and bads a little bit more here, especially with the um, uh, the missions, do you think there is a style of army list 
that you, has universal play into the missions? Like, do you think that the fact that we are seeing this uh, one third, two third kind of build from Chaos Space Marines uh, get elevated is is Chris? When you look at those missions, what does it tell you about the lists you need to have? Um, look, I think you need to look pretty hard because it's not just the missions; it's also the terrain. Um, yeah. So, and and it's like very specific terrain. So, if you're playing, um. The, the normal kind of deployment maps with the with the where the objectives are if the off uh, the mid board objectives that are off center are hidden or not like just totally changes the entire game right um, if they're not hidden shooting you know you may as well just bring all shooting and if they are hidden then all of a sudden you need to bring those elements of speed in there that that melee um yeah that's that's probably all the insight I could give off the top of my head no, that's fair sorry what about yourself yeah, look, I, I think that if you look at what's kind of good right now, like Eldar and CSM, I, I got, I, I'm not quite sure CSM are, you know, are universally as good as Eldar in terms of like, um, just like raw firepower. I know obviously CSM do a lot of damage, but it's like they're, they're, they're not quite the same. Now, Eldar function as an army that's just going to table you, whereas CSM kind of bully you and get into you and, yeah. you know, push. Yeah push units into you and, like, come and aggressively take your primary while I'll uh, just go kill you, right? But what I think is consistent about armies that are performing well is the um, is the access to, like, really powerful reserves. I feel like Rapid Ingress is such a, mm. you know, game-changing stratagem uh, at the moment that having access to cheap reserves that can come and do secondaries and score primary and stuff like that and having access to reserves that do damage... I think are both really important things. So like right right now, that's kind of like I, I think if you want to play really competitively, you need an army that has enough stuff on the board to play the primary game to trade while keeping some stuff off the board to be able to play the reserve game. I, I just feel like rapid ingress is such a, a powerful stratagem right now that you know that that's kind of uh the the consistent thing for me that you need to be able to do if you want to do really well on these missions. Yeah. Great point. Adding, I think that's a phenomenal point. Adding on to that, ninth edition was all about the value of your action monkeys because essentially everything could kill everything. So it actually became a little bit more about the minutiae, like how good was your nonsense? Who had the better nonsense could be, you know, where the game came down to. And by nonsense, I mean like your crude hounds, your unit of scouts, your, you know, your action monkeys that could also go and do a thing and add value in other places. A lot has been made about those in 10th edition also. Chris, do you see those as another value point, seeing as, well, especially uh, you're playing Space Marines, I'm playing Space Marines as well. Space Marine seems to be killer and filler, we would say, from a, an album point of view, you know, has two or three absolute bangers on the track of tracks, and then the rest of it is just filler. Um, I'm talking about, like, your aggressors with Apothecary in a, re- in a Redeemer. I'm talking about your, you know, max unit of Hellblasters and Asriel, I guess, for, you know, Dark Angels, etc. And then the rest of it is just, like, here's my scouts, here's my Voidsman, Here's my assassin. Here's my infiltrators. It's just killer and filler. Is that somewhere we're going with 10th edition? I think to some extent, yes, but a little bit less of an extent than 9th. I think the damage is probably on the whole still a little bit too too potent in 10th, but it's not quite as ridiculous. So you do get a little bit more room for more mid-tier units that can all contribute. Um, but how good you feel it is, is, I mean, that's, I think there's never going to be an addition of, of Warhammer where, um, the feel is not super important because it's always important to be able to put units onto an objective without, um, sacrificing too much when they die. And I guess this is to my point about why um, Eldari and CSM are top of the tables. I think they have the best filler units in the game, especially, um, Eldari, you know, their filler units are, you know, warp spiders. Shadow Spectres, <laughs> they're incredible freaking units. Um, speaking about Chaos Space Marines a bit for yourself, Solly, because I know it's, it's one of your heartthrobs at the moment, um, doesn't seem to be much filler. Everything is just killer. Yeah, but the, the thing about uh, the Chaos Super Faction, right, is you have access to demons, so you have as many yeah, units Nurglings as you want Woo! to screen or to do actions, right? So, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, I, I, I think Chaos Demons are the worst army in the game. However, Nurglings are pretty good for 35 points because who's not going to pay 35 points to drop in and teleport Homer or something like that, right? Like, yeah, no, no Nurglings. Yeah. 
insert whichever points you have left over in loan op specialist unit of changeling blue scribe celeste you know <laughs> yes yeah, pr- pr- pretty, pretty much good. right um but yeah look i i think that the the army rules for csm are, are very good i think the you know the the way that the dark pact rule functions is very good i think it's a little bit too good on some things i think that you know the downside doesn't necessarily um you know match the upside for some units but sometimes it does right sometimes you know everyone's played that game against a forge fiend that's rolled two ones for overheats and it's taken three wounds from the the dark pack that's put itself down to three wounds the first time it shoots at you right there's there's definitely some risk for the reward there um mm-hmm. But yeah, look, man, I don't think the filler in CSM is very good at all. I don't think the filler units in there the are, are good at all. Yeah. They're, they're not filler units, though, right? Exactly like, right. You, you actually feel not, bad when yeah. you lose a 100-point unit to, um, yeah, it's, you know, to to whatever it's doing that isn't scoring points. But obviously demons make uh, demons make that army uh, well, the, the power level that it is right now. Exactly right. Demon, demons take away any possible need for internal filler and CK space wounds. Because it's it literally is cultists of both talents, is what I've seen. Um Yeah, and, and cultists, cultists actually don't do it very well, to be fair. Cultists no, actually don't. are not great filler other than standing on your home objective and exactly right. You know, making it they sticky start. once, right? That's kind of all they do. Yeah. Um, all right. So Chris, transitioning to I suppose looking to the future of 10th edition, we probably we have a battle star like coming in a couple of months. What would you like to see from it if you had one wish? Um, I touched on it before. I'd like to see Melee get better. So, like, there's just the actual unit profiles themselves. There's just so many things that suck. I'm going to call Witches out as an example. Oh. Absolutely, unbelievably bad data sheet. Um, <laughs> so they need to, you know, a lot of Melee units just need a buff. They need to actually do something when they make it into Melee to make it worth the cost of getting through the Overwatch and getting across the table and yeah. all of those things. There are huge swathes of people's armies. People, like so many factions are well rounded, and, and, and you know, in days of yore, had a two thousand point full melee list, two thousand point full shooting list, and so many people are factions. Special, sorry, so many faction specialists have all those options, and now they've just got whole swathes of their collection unusable because that portion just ain't good. And which is are absolutely the best example of that that I can think of. Um, what would you change though, Chris? Sticking with you, like just quickly. Um. I think the the easiest way to do it is just to actually buff the data sheets, make it so they do what they should do when they make it in. So which is probably need an extra attack and an extra AP or something like that. Um, I don't think there's any amount of points drops they're going to make, which is still the role they should fill, right? You can make them cheaper, but they're just guardsmen, essentially. Yeah, so they could change how Overwatch works to make those light melee units. That'd be a little more likely to make it in, but yeah, that's an option too. Solid, what about you? Uh, Phantasm 2 CP is probably <laughs> yeah, the, boy. The, Kill it. The, the one I've been saying forever. Like, <laughs> Phantasm 2 CP, I think, fixes a lot of things. It, it, it is the best stratagem that's ever been printed. Uh, I don't think anyone at this point disagrees with that. It, it is literally the best stratagem JW have ever printed. Uh, it should not be 1 CP. Uh, it's horrendous. Um, I think most Eldar players hear that and, you know, Look at their feet, and they're like, "Oh, don't don't touch my phantasm." But like, it, it is the most obscene stratagem that GW have ever printed. It should not be one CP. Um, yeah, I hundred percent agree. Well, Just right, to go. add on that, when I was playing Elder, people would be like, "All right, it's really important to bring like a Vect style stratagem to make it two CP." Not once did I ever care. I was like, "All right, I'll pay two blink. CP." <laughs> yeah, sure. It like, yeah. It's it's still broken at two CP. <laughs> Yeah, it, it can get vectored, and you, there is still like you wouldn't use it every turn for three, but it could get vectored. It's it's not a battle tactic, is it? So it can't be vectored. I don't even know. No, I'm um, pretty sure that's correct. That, that didn't matter when I was playing Elder. Yeah, I'm saying but like even if it did get vectored now, there are situations where you would pay three for that still. It's, it's like, still 100%. there are still game winning situations where you're just like, well, I phantasm and win, right? Like it, it just happens. Um, it's um, absolutely but, disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, but on that, look, I, I agree with Chris. Uh, I think melee buffs are important. Look, I, I've been playing CSM recently, as we've sort of discussed, and, like, it's been great having, like, the Chaos Lord chosen units and, like, a Cursed Cultist that actually slap in melee. Like, it's been heaps of fun, mm. but it's not the norm. Like, that is not, you know, the experience that most players are having with their melee units right now. And, like, it's it's great for me to say, oh, cool, my, my melee units are kind of fixed, right? Uh, you know, at least until they get nerfed in the next balanced data slate. Um, but 
you know, that's not the experience most players are having. And like I play, you know, Drakari as well. And Chris is right. Which is, you know, witches could be six points model and I wouldn't play them. Um, they are. And I mean, you, you can exchange witches for so many other units. I mean, orc boys are so disappointing. Um, in- yeah, but, but at least orc boys get, you know, the war, right? At least orc boys get that. And look, once you per know, game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, but yeah. but it, it's it's better than witches, is my point. You yeah. know, um, I had a crazy idea for fixing um, at least the first round of combat for melee armies, and that is if if a unit rolls under its move characteristic. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, there was a I wanted to do a charge roll. If you rolled a if you rolled a just reasonable like a seven or more on the charge or some something like that, you got one plus AP on the charge or something, or plus one strength plus one AP. Just something fundamentally simple like that. To just add a little bit of everything, because so many of everyone, so many people have, and it would add a lot of value to charge rerolls, which um, aren't amazing at the moment, but they're okay. And yeah, I just thought, just give, put some blankets, just slap it in the balanced dice, like say, hey, look, everything, this is everything in the game gets this now. Yeah, and that, then that's all of a sudden, risky though, right? Like think about so, Armor it is, Contempt, exactly. Man. Think about when Armor of Contempt came out; it wasn't busted on it's most so things, but some yeah. things, man, some things of Armor of Contempt were. Uh, obscene like those so, sort of changes you're going to be so careful with. exactly so one unit or maybe a handful of units in the game go to the stratosphere of being you know s tier op but then you know two-thirds of people's armies get playable again is, is that that's the idea that's the hope but i i, I fully acknowledge it. something out there would get absolutely bonkers um but on that note, on that bombshell, which probably isn't a bombshell because it's never going to happen, uh, we will close off this episode. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming on and uh, carrying me through these last days of my fourth round of COVID. Much, much they appreciate it. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed that. A bit more of a talking head segment and episode rather than our usual list-by-list, line-by-line review. But Chris, thank you very much for coming on, mate. It's been a great pleasure. Great honor to have you on as always. And Matt, you're our essentially our number one ticket holder for the amount of person who's been on the most amount of episodes. Thank you very much as well. And hope you both enjoy your Sunday afternoons. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to Art of War Down Under. A content review podcast for Warhammer 40K. Hosted by Adam Camilleri. Produced by Seamus Ronan. Enjoyed the show? Want your lists reviewed and the content you heard put into practice? Sign up to our Patreon and connect with us online or on Facebook. Just search for Art of War Down Under. Signing out from tomorrow. Tomorrow.